Hey there, welcome back to Last Red RPGs. Um, yeah, so today we're going to take a look at Pathfinder 2nd Edition um, in a little bit of a different way. Um, previously we've been looking at like uh, rules and setting up mo or the modules in Foundry. Um, today we're going to go ahead and jump in. We're going to try out uh, setting up an adventure. Um, so let's go ahead and jump over to the screen. So, I'm new to Pathfinder, obviously. Um, there's a few ways you can get resources for it. Um, you can either get it directly from Pathfinder, but right now what I'm looking at doing is testing out the waters. And so, uh, and learning from other people, watching their YouTubes and asking questions, um, there is a site called Demiplane um, and if, if you look it up or if you search uh, Pathfinder Nexus uh, you'll come across this site and to me it really reminds me of D&D uh, &D Beyond because you can do the character creation and all these other things um, they've got all their source books available um, they've got a rule book bundle uh, which contains all the books within the source book category or rule books and then th they've got the lost omens which my understanding is going to be your adventures and so it is very much like D&D &D. Um, if you do a subscription you can share with up to 24 people but for me I'm not looking to do that just yet. I first want to know, one, is this going to be something I want? So I can read up the rules here with the Pathfinder Primer, but they also have some standalone adventures, which is great for me to introduce it to individuals who are curious, uh, like my friends. So uh, we're going to take a look at these three advent standalone adventures uh, and see what they've got. Uh, you'll also notice that there are adventure paths and so these are available to everyone. I haven't paid a penny yet. And so the adventure paths are basically that are freely available are player guides or primers, uh, preparation documents. So if you're going to be running one of these adventure paths, this would be a great thing to share with your players of, hey, here's this free document as a way to get ready for this campaign and that's awesome so with that i am going to admit i oh there we go it does say second edition at the very top okay i was going to say i know i started playing the pathfinder video game called kingmaker so that one this one made me uh, concerned but it does say second edition at the top so all right So, let's go ahead, we're going to and go left to right, um, starting with the threshold of knowledge. Um, start looking at that one, and we will work our way over. So, um, oh, that's a fistful of flowers. Here we go. Um, good little art. I like that. Um, yeah, really don't know who's on what side. That... The person shooting the arrow is kind of hard to tell who they're shooting at. So, let's go ahead, um, reading through the adventure background. Arcane knowledge pulses through the canals of Nantambu, and that knowledge runs from the city's heart, the magical school known as Magambaya. And if I pronounce any of these names wrong, I am, I'm sorry, but, uh, it's my best, best, best effort. Uh, the song Wind City was built up around generous ambitions and desire of old mage Jitembi and the ten magic warriors who followed him, united in their desire to share knowledge of Glorian's mysteries of the mundane and magical alike. The Mangambaya and, by association, Natambu as a whole have fostered a culture of education and discovery for those who are willing to work for it and share in it. 
Okay. Um. More malevolent forces also seek to cross cross the threshold of knowledge that the mighty that the Magambaya act as a bridge to, and their goal is not one of sharing but of domination. In an attempt to gain further power and knowledge, the sea hag Nagaja set her sights on the secrets within Magambaya. Afraid to trespass on the school grounds herself, Nagaja spent several weeks beguiling two younger students to win their aid with promise of magical power and great treasures dancing in their heads the students began to work to acquire information from Nagaya, nagaja unbeknownst to them nagaja has no intention to uphold her end of the bargain these misguided students merely pawns in nagaja's cruel machinations left uncontested Nagaja's schemes mean the end of the Magambaya, but the school is a place of great learning and even greater heroes. Several young students will find themselves embroiled in the Sea Hag's plot and have a chance to put her, put an end to her wicked plans. This adventure is designed for four to, or five first level heroes. Groups who want to start right away can play using the pre-generated characters found in the adventure toolbox. This adventure gives promising students the chance to become heroes by saving the world's greatest magic school. This adventure also serves as a wonderful introduction for new players into Pathfinder 2nd Edition and to the wider hobby of tabletop role-playing games. Okay, so, and this, this is something that all three of these adventures do, is they provide you with a toolbox that gives you all the needed stat blocks, all the, um, and I'll, I'll show you right now, um, because I think this is amazing. It gives you all the magical items or unique items. Um, it gives you all your uh, unique spells. Uh, the heroes may find the following new spells useful in this adventure. Um, Akini? Okay, and so this is one of your pre-generated characters from my understanding. Um, many in the Mwanji Expanse believe Ikaji Elves are dedicated isolationists, but they are actually close allies to the Magambaya. On a trip to deliver relics there, two Akaji lore bearers brought their daughter Akini. After concluding their business, they told Akini that she was to stay and learn. Her first lonely night in the dormitory was also the first time the serious young elf ever wept. Akini spent her youth training to be one of the Akaji's defenders. She believed the warrior's road was her life's path, not that of a scholar. She worked hard at her studies made her, to make her parents proud, even though she still doesn't feel like she belongs. Ikini's traditional Ikioji paint markings have faded since her arrival, and she has intentionally chosen not to reapply them. Her, she hopes to have her family apply new markings upon her return that better represent the person she will become upon leaving the Magambaya, whether or not it's who they expect her to be. Alright, Ikini is generally amiable, but is particularly close with Marua, as the two share a love for climbing trees and spending time outdoors. Alright, so this does look like it is, oh, yep, a player character, um, a female elf monk, um, would be very easy to like kind of reskin it so it's a male uh, monk and changing the names not an issue um, but yeah you've got these pre-generated characters who have some backstory uh, so if you wanted to continue the adventure after uh, well if you wanted to continue with something beyond this adventure you could which is amazing um, it's a great setup that Pathfinder has done Especially, like they said, for new players. This is great. Um, so that's the Adventure Toolbox. Um, I think that is a great, great resource to have involved. Um, it is amazing to have that. Alright, so let's go ahead. Let's take a look at Little Trouble in Big Absalom. Um. For generations, 
For generations, the Hook Claw Kobolds have lived beneath the city known as Absalom, scratching out of hard scrabbled existence by scavenging from the earth packed ruins of ancient bur buried buildings. In all that time, the Hook Claws have never been conquered or wiped out by more powerful forces, which makes them truly prestigious by Kobold standards. Unfortunately, this prestige has never resulted in wealth or comfort. For as long as the Hook Claws have existed, they have lived in relative austerity among meager warrens and have simmered with envy at more famous and well-off Cobalt clans, such as the renowned Sewer Dragons. Yet the smell of change is in the air. Just recently, a party of Hook Claw miners accidentally broke into an underground room that was stuffed full of treasure and luxuries, most of them in far better condition than the time-rotted relics that the Hook Claws typically own. Firm advocates of looking gift horses in the mouth, however, the Hook Claws have rounded up their greatest heroes, most eager volunteers, and most violent misanthropes to explore the mysterious area. Once the chamber has been secured and deemed safe, the Hook Claws can cart off the treasure and live the opulent lives they have long deserved. Okay. Oh, this is interesting, because the treasure's already been found. Now they're trying to clear out the dungeon. <laughs> okay, that is interesting. Um, that could be a fun one. Uh, especially with kobolds uh, who typically have, like, squeaky voices or something like that. So this one sounds a lot like a dungeon crawl. Whereas the previous one sounded more like a, um... Almost more of a mystery. So... I'm going to guess that this third one um, a fistful of flowers is going to be more social driven um, I, I, though they all probably do have um, a good amount of exploration and uh, combat as well so a fistful of flowers the Verderan forest is the largest world woodland in Avistan, despite the fact that it sprawls across some of the oldest and most powerful nations in the inner sea region the druids fey and other residents of the wilderness have always resisted incursions from nearby civilizations in nations like andoran this resistance has often led to violence as wildwood druids protect fey protective fey and local centaurs clash with explosive exploitive logging companies. Yet not all relationships proved so agnotistic. In Taldor, the Empire still holds to the Wildwood Treaty it signed in 3841 AR, which grants the forest local pr legal protections and limits the amount of resources locals could take in a given year. Of course, not every citizen respects the laws of their nations, and selfish or desperate individuals often attempt to skirt Taldor's regulations. The latest of these infractions occurred when a Taldon noblewoman named Lady Constance uh, Mel Meliosa encountered a peculiar creature on one of her luxury camping expeditions, a tiny plant animated by a nature spirit known as a leshy. Okay. I've heard about Leshies. Um, Consonants immediately fell in love with the creature and captured them, taking them to her manor to display it to all of her noble friends. Since the poor Leshy couldn't speak, the nobles interpreted her frantic attempts to escape as nothing more than adorable antics. To Lady Constance and her fellow aristocrats, the Leshy was little more than a pet to be brought out on display. It wouldn't be long before Constance decided that a single Leshly wasn't enough. She needed more Leshies to decorate her abode. Though she learned how to make her own Leshies, the ones from Verderan Forest proved more popular with the local ladies. And so Constance made arrangements with a shady business contact. A week later, a crate of abducted, smuggled Leshies arrived at the manor, and Constance set about arranging the imprisoned plants, unaware and uncaring that the forest 
had its own protectors. Ooh, okay. All right, well, so much for uh, being a lot more social. <laughs> uh, that actually sounds a lot more combative, and I think I actually saw a little bit of a live play on this one. So, um, I think these boat. Wow, uh, I wasn't expecting a fistful of flowers to sound so good, honestly. Um, so that's really cool that uh, they made it so appealing. Um, but uh, looking, uh, yeah, let's just take a little bit more of a look into the uh, chapters. Because there are two chapters to this one. Uh, there's a river crossing. Uh, here's a little ferry that is... In, yep, I did see this gameplay. Uh, I saw it with... Um, Oh, I can't remember. Uh, Crash Gym. They ran through it, I want to say on Tuesday. Maybe Monday. Um, so, um, you'll see that like you got stat blocks for unique NPCs. Um, you've got stat blocks for creatures. Um, but, yep. Uh, there's this one. Um, I th actually, I'm honestly personally leaning towards uh, the one with the kobolds. I think that's fun. Um, I like that. I, I think it's interesting that two of the three adventures, it's kind of you're kind of locked in already on your choice of race. So. All right, let's go ahead. Let's take. Let's go ahead and take the um, Little Trouble and Big Absalom and let's work on that with Foundry. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new world. So I'm working on the for through the forge. Um, if you're not familiar with how to set up a new world, um, in Foundry, um, I'll go ahead and just pull this up and I'll show you real quick right there. But yes, this is going to be a brand new world, clean slate, starting from scratch. Now, I could work through Foundry for this. Or I could um, work through the forge. Considering I'm going to work, I'll be hosting it through the forge, that's where I'm going to start with. Uh, but simply enough, go, you go create world, you type in your world, you have your game system, you, that's how you create your world. That's for basic forge. All right, for, or foundry. For forge, uh, you have to go to game configurations, create new game. Um, if you haven't used the game system before, you'll have to search for it. I've used second edition already, so it's right here for me. Um, and it's selected. There we go. Now, what's the name of the world? Um, well, I'm going to name it after the adventure we're doing. So I'm going to put my adventure over here on the side. Uh, we're going to put little trouble, big Absalom. So I'm going to go LT. Oh, little trouble. No, what? Let's just let it be as is that folder name. Um, because then there's no confusion. Now, one thing I think I'll do is I'm going to save this image that is uh, Little Trouble and Big Absalom. I'm going to save it here. And I'm going to pull up that folder now.
That way I have a visual indication of what I'm working with. But also now, if I go into my games, I'm looking for my games. Oh, I didn't finish creating it. I might have to start over. Yep. Oh, nope. Here we go. Oh, it didn't save. Save changes. There we go. Alright. Now, we can go ahead. Let's put the adventure background here. Um, Alright, here we go. And I'm actually going to launch my Pathfinder. Nah, I'm not. I was thinking about launching my Pathfinder 2e game. That way I can get the module settings from there. Honestly, I probably should. Now, normally you can't open two worlds at the same time. Unless you have two licenses at the same time. Which I do. So uh, That is one perk to having multiple licenses, but also it makes it so you can have your worlds open at the same time. And if someone has to sign in to do character customizing with leveling up or something, then it's not an issue. Um, one nice thing I like um, is with version 10 of Foundry, you now have tutorials. Um, I'm not going to go through the tutorials today, um, but it is a, it's a nice welcoming, it's a nice welcome in my opinion. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to grab, um, I'm going to grab my settings and also, hmm. Alright, I have to enable some of these. Um. Let's see here. Uh, all right, yep, this is kind of the boring part, uh, enabling different th th settings. Um, the nice thing is, is I won't have to uh, come through and uh, edit, really, because um, everything will already be kind of updated. So. Let's see here. Have to have that one. All right, here we go. All right. As you can, I'm, right now I'm just going off of memory. I know there there are some that I use on every world and so um, it's actually pretty quick and easy. Um, there used to be that there was a module that would allow me to import and export my modules. Um, but um, I'm not seeing that. So I must be missing something or I just am not aware of it, it's where, of where it is. So, uh, just got to go through and select them real quick, and then we'll be right into it.
one I missed. Uh, Forge more awesome. I do run off of Chrome, so you can use, uh, and if you're on the Forge, you can use uh, more awesome. It gives it more of a foundry feel to it. Um, I think I might actually use the token action HUD. Let's see here. Oh, interesting. I don't have that enabled. Okay. Um, then it looks like that's the only other one. Let's see here. Um, tokens up or torches updated. So my, that one should work. Um, I don't know if there are any others that I want or need onto this. And I bet you one of the modules I needed was the tidy UI game settings. I bet you that's the one I was missing on uh, my other world. And that's why I could not export the modules. If I had it enabled, I probably could have exported them and then imported. So um, tidy UI is help very helpful in that sense. So. Uh, Let's see here. I'm going to go just, I want to check. Yep, there we go. Uncheck all but tidy UI. Check all modules. There's our export active module list. Import it. That would have made this so much easier. All right. So <laughs> um, select your computer's quality level. This helps with players uh, who have different levels of uh, computers. I'm just going to go with the standard. It's going to refresh the world as usual. Um, but uh, I'm going to close out those windows, get through them as quick as possible, and we can get started on putting in a Little Trouble in Big Aslam. So, I have no problem with this being kind of the welcome screen landing page. Um, I do actually need to import my JSON settings. There we go. And it's going to refresh the world. It might take, it might do it two or three times actually. So um, we'll see how long it takes. And once it's ready, we will be rocking and rolling. Hmm. Um, so to for chapter one of this, um, let's actually take a quick look. If the players are new to Pathfinder, take this time to allow them to introduce their characters to one another or, and become familiar with how their character is supposed to work. You can also provide some light role playing before the PCs move on to begin their adventure. The PCs are the first kobolds to explore this mysterious chamber beyond a few cautious glances. So the other kobolds of the Hook Claw clan have no useful information to offer about what challenges might lie ahead. And then we've got a little map. Oh, I can. Let's do this. Here we go. All right. Um. So this is the little primer I just read. Um. But here's the cobalt basement. Um. So A one. All right. So we got a little entrance down here. The Hook Claw's mysterious treasure vault is actually a house's basement. The Hook Claw tunnelers who originally found the room accidentally dug into the cellar of a modestly well-off family in Aslam's <laughs> residential Eastgate district. Yet to the Hook Claws who make their living scavenging from buried ruins and who have rarely encountered surface cities beyond hearsay, uh, this is simply another forgotten subterranean chamber, <laughs> and even if the hook laws knew the building was occupied, they would still want the contents of the cellar. <gasps> oh gosh. So we got Beanie breaking and entering. Okay. <laughs> oh boy, this will be interesting. <laughs> The familiar smell of earth and musty neglect wafts across your nostrils as you scuttle through the dirt tunnel and into the chamber. From here you can see past the curtains of rich fabric and giant wooden crates in the rest of the room. 
Stacks of books and other luxury items are haphazardly crammed into massive wooden shelves, preserved from mold despite their clear abandonment. <laughs> Immense piles of furniture, rich with intricate carvings and plush cushions, have been jammed up against the walls. Chests with glittering locks lie on the floor, coated with dust. A pile of casks, sacks, and barrels form a looming barricade across the western end of the room, which blocks the rest of the chamber from view. Oh gosh, this is hilarious. <laughs> um, and then it gives us some information. The crazy chests contain old books, worn toys, dolls, clothing, shoes, some of which may even be small enough to fit a cobalt. Small painted portraits of dark-skinned humans and holiday decor. A PC who succeeds a DC 13 perception check notices a soft glow of concealed, a soft light, a soft glow of light concealed beneath the thick quilts of a nearby beds. While the cellar is relatively well sealed from the elements, insects have crept through the walls over the decades, making this home their dry environment. Among the more intrusive residents are a small group of flash beetles, which normally hide underneath stored beds to conceal their luminescence. The flash beetles are not aggressive, but if they sense a creature approaching within five feet, they perceive it as a threat and attack out of instinct. So, um, <laughs> this is going to be interesting. I like it. Uh, this could be a lot of fun. I also just realized, let me go ahead and... There we go. I've got Strahd on my screen right now. <laughs> Let's fix that. Yep, so last night running ran Curse of Strahd, so... That would be why. Alright, um... Let's do this. There we go. All right, that looks better. So, let's see what we've got for. Um, so, and then the, you just hover over, and it tells you what a flash beetle is. I mean, that's that's amazing. Um, oh, okay, very interesting. It gives you a lot. Um, Wow, Th this is amazing that it gives you all this information. And it's quick and easy to access. Like, whoever designed this, I'm just like, kudos for you. You've done a great job. Um, and it's... What's nice is that it's very quick and easy to read and understand. Um, this is well done. Uh, the beetles are simply animals defending their territory. They don't pursue the PCs beyond 30 feet, and they flee if reduced below half their hit points. This is very important. It gives the DM instructions on how to play the or play the NPCs, the monsters. A PC can also spend two action and attempt a DC 15 nature check to try and soothe a single flash beetle. On a success, the beetle ceases hostilities unless it's attacked or harmed again. Um, if the PCs soothe or otherwise neutralize the flash beetles without harming the creatures, award them XP as if they had defeated the creatures in combat. Okay, so you can either defeat them or pacify them, and you get experience points. That's good. I'm glad they did make a note of that, uh, because I know that was one thing that uh, first-time DMs might not be sure about. Like, oh, well, you guys didn't kill, so you don't get the experience points. Well, they dealt with the situation, though. So, uh, that is very cool that they included that. All right, let's go ahead and hop over. Um, and the nice thing is, you got a full-size map, or you've got a full-size player map. 
um, which I think both of which are very important to have. So. All right. Let's see here. Um, I, I do notice that there are a few things I don't like. Uh, one of the modules has gotten rid of the little anvil up here in the top left corner. Um, I'm using Foundry. I want that to be seen because I 100% love Foundry. I have used Roll20, Fantasy Grounds, uh, and I hate them. I, I will never play on those platforms. Uh, even as a player, I won't. So, all right, leaving this as a la landing screen, uh, we're gonna go ahead and create. A, I'm just gonna create a folder. Um, it was actually pretty stupid to name this world um, "Little Trouble in Big Absalom," just because I, I think I'm gonna just keep using it for one shots and whatnot. So, let's go ahead. Um, what is this place called? Chapter one, the tomb. <laughs> well, let's call it the tomb. Um, it is going to be funny to see what the, er, actually we don't need to call it that. We need to call the folder, um, little trouble in big Absalom. The scene, we'll call it the tomb. Okay. We're gonna download or add a new picture. Uh, I keep all my scenes um, in the world folder. All right, let's see here. And then we're gonna go, well, I don't think we need to do too much. So we're gonna choose to import it. And here we go. Now we're going to select that file. Um, the one thing I wish I knew, and I don't know, is um, the dimensions of this map. And I'm not talking about just the pixels, I'm talking. Um, like how many grids are there or yeah how many squares so um, let's see here what do I know well I know the size is a 2700 by 1800 which is going to be apparent right here so that should be a 27 by 18 let's view the scene let's see what we got um, yeah, that doesn't really line up too well. Uh, let's make this a little more apparent, shall we? Because each square is supposed to be five feet. So this is where I go to uh, grid controls. This is using grid scaler. And uh, I can do it by a single square or I can do it by, by uh, three by three. Uh, three by three, you're gonna get a more accurate reading. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I think that's gonna give me my best result. And that's pretty darn close. Um, just gonna take a little tweaking now. So I'm happy with that. Um, nothing's changed with the scale. I'm, now I'm gonna use the built-in foundry grid configuration tool. Because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shift things around just a little bit. And if you look, it looks like it fades off line or off the line just a touch. Um, but really, it's not that bad. I can deal with it being off as little as it is. It's actually not bad at all. So I'm gonna save the changes. There's my grid. Uh, change this back to zero, zero. Uh, and uh, honestly, I can do without the grid because it has a built-in grid. 
Um, I do like that the grid lines up easily enough. So we're going to go ahead and save those changes. Oh, actually, I'm going to do a few other things I like to do. Uh, one thing I like to do is have it be a vertical fit that does not include the sidebar. And it has the behind the sidebar but blackened, so it's easier to see. Um, All right, I think that is going to be the start of everything for us. All right, now walls. Um, as we see here, we've got the border installed now. Uh, I'm gonna install one set of walls that I think are very useful. And that is a set of walls around the compass. That way I can have it so the compass is always available. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a light in here. I'm going to edit it so that I don't care about the dim, I care about the bright being full size to the box. Um, and the advanced option is it provides a uh, vision. So that means no matter where they are on the map, they will always be able to see the compass rows. Okay, uh, this actually is going to be a very straightforward map, which I appreciate. Um, so I'm going to draw some walls. Uh, I'm going to just do a box form. Uh, I am going in the wall a little, or into the dirt terrain that's around the wall a little bit. And I'm going to call that one good. Um, now. There are a few things I need to fix. Uh, so we have our cave or our tunnel from the underground right here. Uh, this is where the players are going to start. Players start right up here. So I'm going to grab. Oh, that did not stay how I wanted it to. Uh, grab the tools, separate the walls a little bit. Uh, same thing here. Um, All right. And we're gonna, oh, nope, don't need another boxed wall. We just need another simple wall. So we're gonna go here to here. And there we go. That's the perimeter walled in pretty quick and easy. Let's see here. Um, honestly, these ones are going to be straightforward too. Just going to do an angled. Um, no, th no need to really get too fancy with walls. Uh, I mean, you can, and I love doing that. Um, but really, uh, there's a time and place for it. And. Uh, with how these walls are, um, there's no uh, no need to get fancy with them. So, um, and then I like making it so all my walls are changed after the fact, or that I can change them when I get to that part. So, like right now, I'm just getting all the walls I need down and then what I'll do is I will uh, go and edit what type of wall it is afterwards if I need to and for, so far I've got doors so that's easy enough to do All right, um, there you go, there's walling. Let's go ahead and get these doors switched over. I do not know if they're gonna be, well, they're not gonna be secret because it's gonna be obvious that there's doors. Um, but I don't know if they're open or locked. But they're definitely not secret. So, there's our walling. Um, as for lighting, I don't think we're gonna be doing any lighting. Um, 
we're just going to rely on the Cobalt's vision. Now, what I do want to do... Hmm, I'm debating if I want to put up um, terrain walls. And basically that makes it so that if you have two terrain walls in your way, you can't see past that second terrain wall. If you have... If you get past the, that one, the one, then now you can see. Alright, let's see here. Let's go ahead and just go with that. Um, we've got the scene put together. Uh, let's go through each section and give it what information we need. Um, so what I'm going to go ahead and do, we're going to create a journal. Um, We're gonna name it what it is. Little trouble, big Absal Absalom. And we're gonna create a page. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and copy the information that was already provided in this adventure. Um, and then I will uh, break it down as I need to. Um, Um, like this here. There we go. Uh, now, anytime I have blocks, block quote information, I know I need to read that. Um, and now we're going to add a page for crypt. Uh, I'm going to do something different with this. So it's not a level one. It's going to be a level two. And we're going to close that. So what that should do is it should make it so that... Uh, well, it didn't really, did it? Alright. Well, let's see what we can do with it. Um, we're going to copy this stuff over. The only thing I'm going to... I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to get rid of the Flash Beetle. Um, well, actually, let's get rid of the Flash Beetle's information. I'm going to keep the Flash Beetle there. And you'll find out why here in a little bit. But, um, yep. I do want some spacing on this. Actually. Oh, wow, there's... You got tons of fonts with custom font. Uh, tons. All right. We got block quote here. And so now for Flash Beetle. Oh, oh. Okay. Well, let's do this. Um, we're going to edit chapter one because that's what we're working with right now. All right. We're going to copy and paste this in again, but we're doing it right down here. The reason why is because this should um, make it so it is uh, separate accordingly. Uh, let's change the heading to heading 2. Let's see how that works out for... Okay. 
All right, yep, that's exactly how I want this to work. So if you change the heading style, so heading one, two, through one through six, uh, you'll see here on the left, it also indents it accordingly. So that is exactly what we're gonna need and we'll work from, with that from there. Um, okay. Uh, now this moderation one, uh, I'm assuming is the difficulty. So let's go ahead and going through this, we need flash beetles. Um, flash beetles, I am not going to do as heading three. Um, and it's interesting to me that it's actually not, oh, it's not bringing up heading threes. It's only bringing up heading twos on the left. So uh, you'll have your page, you'll have heading one, heading two. Okay, that's very nice because flash beetles to me don't need to be um, on this side panel for pages. Okay. Yeah, and see, I can click on that and that's not bringing up a flash beetle. So, what I, oh, flash beetles, four. There's four flash beetles, okay. Um, what I would do, well, first I would start, let's check the, whew, all right, sorry about the whistle, that was probably loud. Um, there's quite a bit of creatures. Um, and this is all provided Pathfinder 2nd Edition. I have not bought anything. So, let's see here. Uh, it looks like it is just in the Pathfinder 2nd Edition Bestiary. Um, I don't know which one. So let's just take a look. Oh, FLA Flash Beetle. All right, let's go ahead and import that. So we have our, yep, this is looking just like what we saw earlier. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight C Flash Beetle. I'm going to highlight the Flash Beetle. And I'm going to drop in the Flash Beetle. Now, when I save this, now we can see on the actual journal where it says see Flash Beetle, we can click on it and it'll bring up the character sheet or the actor sheet. So that is very helpful. Um, the only thing I need to do now is grab some art for it. Right now, that is not a high priority for me, but um, that is very nice that it's quick and easy to do. Um, it just, it right now, Pathfinder is amazing me, uh, just because like 5e, you had the SRD stuff and that was it. Um, it was not as helpful as this is. I think, honestly, I think most of the bestiary is in here which is just mind-boggling to me. Um, and I haven't bought the module for Foundry for Pathfinder. Um, and so, like, for this to just have all this is amazing. Alright. So, there is that. Um, And so actually what I would do at this point, uh, we know that they're in the beds. I would put, that's bright. I'm gonna put some invisible beetles in here. Um, and what I would do is I would describe to the players that they see a faint glow from uh, under those sheets if they roll that or have that passive uh, if they have that perception check, which is a DC 13, so it's pretty low um, by any game system standards. So, all right. Um, all 
now oh oh interesting all right so it's a negative one creature which uh to me it seems like it would be a creature that's not much of a challenge though it's the, everyone's playing kobolds i wonder if that still holds true um i i honestly i genuinely do not know and i'm curious um so we got the beetles then we've got area two Area 2 is going to be the uh, stack of crates and whatnot, right in here. And so, a stacked wall of books, barrels, sacks of salt, sugar, crates of pres preserves, casks of wine, and jugs of molasses block the kobolds from traveling to the west. Unfortunately, this wall was haphazardly built and is highly unstable. Hazard, attempting to climb over the wall or remove an object from the pile risks collapse all right so the precarious pile is an environmental uh challenge it has a stealth there's a stealth dc of nine description this dangerously unsteady pile of miscellaneous goods stands seven feet high and ten feet wide uh it looks like it's about 20. disable a dc 15 thievery to carefully evacuate excavate the path through the wall without upsetting its balance or a DC 17 athletics to uphold any unstable portions it has an armor class fortifi fortification uh, I don't want wrath um, not too sure what that one is uh, hardiness of five hit points of 25 uh, BT of 12 okay that's a different one to me uh, immunities, critical hits, object immunities, uh, pre precision damage, collapse trigger. A creature attempts to climb or remove an object from the wall, or the wall suffers a forceful impact effect. The wall collapses, dealing 2d8 bludgeoning damage to the creatures on or within 10 feet of it. A creature that success or succeeds at a DC 18 reflex save takes half damage and rolls out of the way in a random direction. On a critical success, they take no damage and can choose the direction. Okay, very nice. Um, one thing I like to do is tier my successes. And so for them to automatically say, hey, if you do uh, this level uh, DC 18, you succeed, uh, but you take half damage. If you roll critical success, did you take none it's great i like it uh development if the wall collapses for any reason a haunting indistinct feminine voice can be he heard echoing a sing song throughout the basement for a few moments after the sounds of the falling clutter dies away the voice belongs to camilla c area a7 a soul-bound doll who resides in the basement and who is calling out for her former playmate. Ooh. So, I love that right off the bat we've got um, a potential combat, which could be kind of social depending on how the players interact with it, but we also have um, an environmental situation where attacking it unless you can hit it and deal 25 damage in one hit which at level one i don't think any of the player characters can do um you're going to cause noise and it's going to cause an effect i love this uh this is great this is great uh campaign building material honestly um in my opinion, Paizo has learned what their predecessor, um, the one that they have uh, shifted away from, has not. Um, and honestly, I'm a big fan of what they're doing. Um, so, and there we go. Area A2, non-compliant wall. It's a trivial one challenge. Um, 
no. I th what I don't see is I don't see a chat or a talk or a black quote section in there, which is fine. Um, now, the only issue I have is if you look at this, the precarious pile hazard two, environmental, all this is supposed to be in like a little text box, but it's not. So I want to see if I can do something to kind of pull it together so it kind of um, is highlighted in a way. Uh, the best way I can think of is just making it secret. And now it kind of pulls it all into one thing together. And to me, that's the best way I can do it. Uh, same thing with the beetle, honestly. We'll go in here, we'll put secret on it. Um, I think that's just the best way to do those. Now, does it really matter for the players? No, because they're not going to see this at all. I'm not going to, I don't want them to see it. So. Now, my question is Camilla, because Camilla is an actor or a character in this, and they are a creature too. Um, so what I want to do, and so I What's really nice is like I click on Camilla here on um, here on Demi Plane of the Pathfinder Nexus. I click on Camilla, it brings up her little block here on the right. Automatically, that is that is tremendously helpful. Thank you, Demi Plane, for just doing this, um, and Pathfinder for working with them to get this done. But I also like is that at the very foot down here, it tells you, you can find this in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, Little Trouble in Big Absalom. So and it's, right now, I'm thinking, okay, maybe there's more to this than just this little introductory adventure. So let's, let's go see in Foundry, because they've got a lot of things. Um, Let's see if we can find Little Trouble. Um, just because it would be very helpful if it's already in here in some capacity. Uh, I am not seeing Little Trouble in Big Absalom. So, what we might end up having to do is... Um, we've got Troubles in Atari. Yep, it looks like we might have to create a character sheet for uh, Camilla. Uh, so let me try one more thing real quick. Um, I, let's see what the PFS introductions... Nope, that's not going to be up. Wait a second. PFS introductions. This has tr environmental actors. Holy cow, that is a game changer. Um, that, wow, that is, that is an amazing game changer. Um, I wish I knew where to find in here something that is like the precarious pile. Um, We could, yeah, because something like that would be super useful. Um, wow, uh, that is so cool. Alright, well, I'm not seeing Camilla. Let's go ahead, let's get Camilla in here. Let's do it. Um, actually, real quick, just because I have it in my mind. All right, I do not have an image for the Flash Beetle. Um, ah, it's going to bug me otherwise. All right, I'm going to go with core data because I know that... Um, ooh, huh, 
I know that there's some icons out there. Uh, actually, I might have some assets. So let's go into tokens. Oh, I don't think I've uploaded all the uh, tokens I've got. Let's see here. Um, no, let's just do this. I am looking for a beetle. I know I have a lot of tokens. Um, those are not the ones I'm looking for, though. So. Um, I'm just going to create a folder. Uh, this one is going to be called Sandbox Adventures. Uh, so this beetle that I'm going to be pulling in is from Sandbox Adventures, most, more specifically uh, Tomb of the Forgotten Evil. Uh, this is a f fun little third-party adventure, or, yeah, third-party created adventure for, that I have used for 5th edition. Um, I would be curious to see how well it translates over to Pathfinder, to be honest, because it, it, it's not bad. And holy brightness, uh, they are bright. Alright, so there we go, we got our beetles in there. Um, we got some art for them. Alright, now... Camilla. Um, I'm going to have to save Camilla's image um, just because I don't have something for her. Uh, but they do provide something in here for a token for her. Or not for a token, but for her art. Uh, so I'll start off with that, but then I'll switch over to something later on. But we're going to create an actor. We're going to name them Camilla. And we're going to see how well creating a actor in here. Oh, oops. I made a player character. I don't need a player character. Create an actor. And this is one thing I'd love about Pathfinder 2nd Edition on Foundry. You've got player characters, NPCs, and vehicles. Just like 5th Edition does. But you've also got hazards, loot, and familiars. That, that is just so helpful. All right, Camilla. Right now, I can go in here. I'm going to go with my assets. Uh, again, I'm going to go into tokens. Uh, this one, I'm going to go ahead and go PF2E um, because Pathfinder Second Edition. That's who that they own it. Um, I'm not taking any credit for their art. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead LTIBA. Little trouble in biggest Absalom. We're going to choose a file. Um, I'm going to go back into where I've got everything else for this adventure. Uh, something that looked a little janky on that one. I'm going to select that. Okay, it looks just fine now. Um, one thing I will have to do is I will have to go and create a token for it instead of just... Oh, here you go. Here's a doll figurine. Uh, I will want to make a token. Uh, actually, Camilla as is might work just fine. So, Camilla is a creature too. Uh, let's see what we got. Uh, she is NE, neutral evil. She is tiny. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to compare these two just because... Okay, traits. Oh, very nice. Construct and soulbound. Oh, there it was. That, oh, that is nice. That is very easy. This is... this. Check AON, then I can tell you the book to check. Uh, what is AON? Deathy25? 
Sorry, I just saw that. Let's see here. In the meantime, I'm going to keep pressing forward. Perception is a plus eight. Uh, dark vision. Pendium. Oh, nothing for AON. Okay. here we got dark vision languages uh, one spoken by the creator so we're gonna go think common okay uh, skills we have acrobatics oculatism and we have stealth all right, so we got a plus eight. That's gonna be quick and easy. Uh, plus four and a plus eight. Um, we do not have lore, so we're gonna update the actor there. For strength, we have a negative two, plus four. Oh, oh you're not, not playing nice now. Con is plus three. Intelligence is a zero. Wisdom is a plus two. And a charisma is plus zero. All right, so we can leave those alone now. Um, and then we got personality fragments. Um, that, to me, I don't understand that is that sounds like a feature um, so not under inventory not under spells notes private public hmm let's go ahead we'll start with private notes on this one um, copy that paste it in save that that we would refer to it if we need to. A uh, soul-bound doll shares fragments of its donor's soul's personality, though none of the creature's memories. This causes a soul-bound doll to match the donor's soul's alignment and gain the corresponding alignment traits. Ooh. Does not sound like a fun little doll, especially if it's chaotic evil, or neutral evil. All right, so armor class, oh well, 20. To me, uh, coming from 5th edition, that is high. I know with a little bit of Pathfinder that I've experienced so far, uh, that is not actually that high. Um, fort is a plus 7. Uh, I wish Tab would work on the character sheets. Uh, I'm kind of disappointed it doesn't because it makes it a little more challenging. Because now I have to click on everything. Uh, HP is at a 23. Okay. Temporary hit points? Nope. Immunities. All right, so we got bleed. Death effects. We 
we've got disease. Doomed and drained. All right, this, this part could be a lot quicker um, if I could just have a ch checklist and have them go. Uh, just because this is this is gonna be slow. Um, doomed, drained. Fatigued. Healing. Mental. Necromancy. Non-lethal. Non-lethal attacks. Okay. Uh, paralyzed. Poison. Uh, sickened. Almost there. And unconscious. Holy cow, that's a lot of immunities. Um, at least that, it seems like it to me. Alright, so we got all those immunities. Um, don't have any weaknesses or resistances. Um, let's see here. Speed. Um, da -da -da. Oh wow, well, they even have spells. Okay. Um, Last I tried, importing spells did not work too well. You know what? I'm going to try this real quick. Um, let's see what I can search with Soulbound Doll for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Okay, it looks like it comes from the Bestiary. So let's go ahead, let's go into Bestiary 1. Uh, this is just going to be quicker and easier. Uh, we are looking for a neutral evil. Uh, let's compare... Oof. Yeah, this was going to take a while. Um, innate spells. Um, neutral evil has harm. Does this? It does have harm. Okay. Uh, this looks exactly what we need. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. This has everything we needed. Uh, the only thing we'll need to do is change the name to Camilla, as well as the art. Um, and it also has the initiative score. So, yeah. Um, goodbye, current Camilla. You're going to get deleted. That was taking way too long. Um, and we're going to import this one. We're going to open it up. Name it Camilla. Give it Camilla's art. We're going to go in here. Tokens. Pathfinder 2E. There we go. Alright, we have Camilla. Once the art loads. All right, let's try this again. Tokens. Nope. Let's find Tui. There we go. Camilla. All right, that worked a lot better. Um, just have to find something that it... Oh, we'll find the creature family. That's what we'll find. Um... Makes me wonder if I can search up uh, the precarious pile for Pathfinder and see if it identifies a source. Um, then maybe I can pull out a char uh, actor for it already. Um, looks like there is one for uh, zombie fest? 
Uh, it doesn't look like it goes by that name in here. Um, what else is this called? Bloodlords. Oh, there we go. Uh, let's look for the precarious pile. Precarious bone pile? That's not quite what we're looking for. Um, just going to keep it off to the side here. Oh yeah, a hazard 3. We're looking for a hazard 2. Um, so a little bit out of reach right now. Um, Alright, so not the blood lords. Let's see here. Uh, we've got a few other options. So let's what we got um fist of the ruby phoenix let's see what we got there precarious pile mm, nope not seeing it there lost omens possible lands well that's a quick one to search nope uh the slithering And again, a very quick, short look tells you it's not in there. So, um, is it okay? Huh. Uh, I am not actually seeing anything that has precarious pile as one item. So I don't think I'm. I think what we're going to have to end up doing for that one specifically is taking a closer look at how it's set up for other traps. Um, that other precarious pile I believe it was a bone pile um, this is going to be a good starting point in my opinion um, in fact probably what I would do is I would take this and uh, just gut it and let's just do that uh, let's take that uh, we'll go in here precarious pile uh, we're looking at a hazard 2 uh, stealth DC of nine okay no not 19 nine hmm okay uh, armor class of 16 Let's change that name to Precarious Pile. Ah, uh, here we go. Nine. Huh. Interesting. And then we got our description. All right, let's get this in here. Save that. Uh, disable. Okay, so I want to take a close look at this. Okay. So we're going to go ahead, so 15, and stealth was not an option. Athletics, however, was. Uh, and actually, I need to go change the other one as well. So we got athletics. And we have thievery. All right. Let's see here. Um, I want to use that formatting, so I'm going to leave that alone. But I need to um, 
change the text. So we have DC 15 Thievery. And we're going to DC 17 Athletics. Gonna delete that. And there we go. Now let's save that. Very nice. Oh, and that, that's glorious. Oh, that is so nice. I just wish it was quicker. Like I can click it and I want it just roll. Um, I would love to, after the fact, be able to say, hey, keep the higher, or roll two dice and keep the higher or keep the lower. Um, but this is glorious. This is very, very useful. So, um, always. Did I just figure out? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Um, okay, so I figured out how to make a quick roll. Can't, and I hold okay how do I get it to roll with like an advantage uh, or disadvantage no if I hold shift it brings that window up what about control no oh control makes it private interesting all right so for Pathfinder what I want to see if I can find is if I can find something that makes it so I can have it roll with advantage or disadvantage right away because um, yeah, having this window pop up every time beforehand is kind of annoying. Now for GM I love just bypassing this uh, entirely but I need some sort of hotkey actually let's go ahead and check there might be a hotkey already for um, rolling with advantage or disadvantage so uh, I just want to check real quickly in here uh, see if there is anything that is like that because if there is something great let's see here Okay, now these two I didn't know. Cycle token stack and GM vision. That's so cool. Um, but it does not look like there's anything for uh, advantage rules. Uh, DF chat commands for different roll types, curvy walls, um, drag ruler. see here yeah it doesn't look like there's anything for uh, rolling so I'm gonna have to take a look see if there's a Pathfinder module that uh, enhances the rolling so let's keep on moving along and seeing what we got So let's go ahead, we're going to close that out. That, that was actually really cool to learn. Uh, and I'm very excited about some of this core fundamentals of Pathfinder 2nd Edition within Foundry. It is nice to see it, honestly. So let's go ahead and let's keep looking at what we got here. Because I mean, we're only at A2 and we got a ways to go. Um, oh, let's finish this up real quick. Um, collapse trigger. So let's see here. Let's see. I, uh, this is broken down so nicely. Um, so trigger, 
is a creature attempts to climb or remove an object from the wall or the wall suffers from a forceful impact. Period. All right. Now, this one is going to be a little different. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move that down a little way. The reason being is because I want to edit, do some edits on this. All right. Uh, I do not need bold. There we go. Bold. The wall collapses dealing, and I want this to be quick and easy. 2d8 bludgeoning, and what I'm going to do is like it has down below. Oh, actually, let's put those in parentheses, I guess. That's not a parenthesis. Let's put bludgeoning, and it's in there as well. Uh, damage to a creature. To creatures on or within 10 feet of it. A creature that succeeds at a DC 18 reflex save. So I'm going to copy this. We're going to change the DC from 20 to 18. Takes half damage and rolls out of the way in a random direction. see how that reads um and then we'll go ahead and close this and we'll save that pops in there and i'm gonna have to put a few more things going um because for some reason right now the chat log does not want to scroll. Um, but collapse. Yep. Very cool. Alright. And details. It's a reaction. Uh, yep. Okay. Cool. Leave that there source and author I am going to leave blank just because I well I guess source I can say a uh, little trouble and big Absalom for this book um, author I'm just gonna leave blank because I don't know who all right cool um, I think the only other thing I had to do was like hit points I mean, 25 to me is just absurdly high. Plus 10. Ref is a plus. Plus 10, not 100. Ref is a plus 2. Uh, will, there's nothing there, so there's that. Um, one thing I'm curious about is like, it mentions hardness and a BT of 12. Um, that, those no, that information still doesn't make any sense to me. Um, fortification save, reflex save, and will save, those make sense. So, all right, I'll have to look at those a little more later. Uh, see what we got. Um, not trained. I don't know why it keeps changing it from, I don't, yeah, I don't know why it keeps changing the stealth DC and increases it by 10. That to me is just silly. No sense. Um, I don't 
think there's anything else really that needs done with this one. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and drag that actor out onto here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and make it invisible because it really is. Uh, I am, however, going to um, change its appearance. Um, it's going to be too wide. And it's going to be what? One, two, three, five tall. Five in height. So there we go. We're going to lock it so it doesn't move around. If I, really? You're supposed to be locked. You're not supposed to be moving. It's moving. Probably because I'm the D game master. So there's that. All right, we got Camille uh, in our journal. Let's go ahead and drop Camille into the journal. Now let's save that. All right, so we got a precarious pile hazard two. Actually, let's go ahead and drop in our precarious pile. Save that. Um, Okay, cool. That is actually looking really good right now. So, uh, the one thing actually that I did see, hmm, see, when you're editing the actor, editing the actor sheet, I noticed that you had a Pathfinder 2E section. You have icons, inline header, info block. Like, this is stuff I would have loved to have had for the journals as well. So I'm kind of disappointed that's not there. Um, I mean, at least it's somewhere. But, I mean, like I said, even still, I would love to have it in journals. Alright, let's go ahead. Uh, chapter, or A3. Consumed hallway. Uh, this plain hallway is relatively clear of junk. Along further passage into the back reaches of the tomb. Two rooms lie to the west. Their doors wedged open with smells of fungus and huge clusters of mushrooms. So, uh, with that, we are looking at these two doors. So, they are wedged open. Uh, the fungus in this room originated from the ice box in area A5. A5 is going to be here. Uh, the family that owned the cellar received an unfortunate terrible casserole from a family friend. Too polite to throw the casserole away, but not willing to make the sacrifice of eating it, the family instead left the casserole inside the basement icebox, swearing to get around to it sometime. The casserole festered, eventually exploding into fungus that flourished and evolved to the point of gaining sentience. Uh, this creature, this room, is home to a fungus fleshy, which has claimed this area for its own and doesn't appreciate trespassers. This leshy is currently hiding among the mushrooms, using its change shape ability. It is canny enough not to attack the PCs directly, instead attacking from range, then skirting away to hide in the shadows. If reduced below 5, the leshy flees and does not attack again. And then we got a f um, fungus leshy. Uh, They've got, actually got a pretty interesting little image for these guys. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Uh, there we are. Alright, so let's go ahead. Uh, this is also in the bestiary. Let's, I don't need a soul bound. I need a fungus. But she. We're gonna import. Um, like seriously, this is. If I did not, it, it's crazy to me how simple it is to work with Pathfinder. Uh, this this is just amazing to me how simple and straightforward it is. Uh, now, they are hiding, so I'm turning them invisible. 
just like our uh, flash beetles. Okay. Um, but yeah, this is all very straightforward, easy to use content. Um, Before I do that, let me go ahead and, there we go. There we go. And then we have block text, or block quote right here. Um, uh, gosh, I, uh, this, I, I regret not switching over to another system sooner, honestly. Um, So that's A3, uh, that was this area here. A4, this little office kind of space, is the tomb workshop. This cluttered chamber contains a towering table covered in crafter's tools and surrounded by bundled supplies. Uh, this room was once basement workshop as well as a storage area for travel supplies. As the residents of the household aged, the room became increasingly unused and was eventually abandoned. PCs who search the room find a light hammer, hatchet, five backpacks, four bedrolls, two fishing tackles, artisan tools, 100 feet of rope, and a repair kit. All right, um, now we got some items to work with. This should be good. Um, so, again, changing the heading to heading two. Um, let's go ahead and save that journal just because we have been working so much with it. Um, making sure everything on the left here the actual journal page it looks good and it does so far so that is very nice um, the only thing I need to change is this is a block text or block quote um, treasure I like highlighting treasure so it is easily identifiable um, normally I would do secret but since we're doing secret for um, encounters and creatures and all that I want to do something else uh, let's go with how does block quote look? No, block quote's not going to work. And I, I already know why. Uh, and that's going to be because if I try to do something like um, drop in an item right here. So let's go to compendium. Uh, we're going to close that. We're going to go to items. Uh, where's equipment? Not effects. I'm looking for equipment. Here we go, equipment. And we're looking for a light hammer. So if I import this and I go highlight the section I'm going to be replacing, let's see. All right, let's see how that turned out actually. Okay. The only problem is like it does not wrap uh, wrap around like the rest of the stuff does. So we're going to have to get rid of block quote or code block. Uh, let's see how uh, what block quote is what we're using for um, talk stuff. I think our best bet is we're going to go ahead and go inline, leave the treasure as bold. Um, let's go ahead, let's do the items and let's underline those. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. We got a hatchet, we have backpacks. We have bed rolls. We have fishing tackle. Artisan tools. Rope. And a repair kit. All right. So, just 
quick and simple, placing them with what they are. I love that um, it doesn't change the name uh, because I'm used to if you drop down something it changes the name of it and so if you wanted to edit the name you'd have to readjust it um, but it automatically uses the name that was already there. Oh interesting. So let's see here. I'm seeing that uh, the uh, light hammer that we underlined, so it was more visible, is um, yeah, it did something different. Interesting. Let's see what it does with the repair kit if I underline the whole line. And honestly, I don't need to underline it because those items are going to stand out anyways. Okay, so let's underline, get rid of the underlines and save that. There we go. That looks perfectly fine. Um, maybe if there's something out there for journals for um, highlighting, that would be great. Um, but for now, uh, that should be fine as is. All right. Now we've got a five, the abandoned ice box, which is going to be down here, uh, our little bluish room. Uh, to me, I initially, my initial thought was, oh, it's a, uh, greenhouse, but yeah, it makes sense for a seller to have an ice. For a seller to have an ice box more than it does to have a cell, uh, greenhouse, but um, also the story of hey, <laughs> something kind of blew up and became a uh, fungus uh, also makes sense. So the abandoned ice box. Uh, again, if we're changing it heading to uh, treasure uh, now. One thing I've learned by doing all this so far is uh, that you can make these little chat boxes like this uh, that I actually really, really love. Um, and I'm gonna, I, I like doing it that it's trained. Uh, you know what? We're going to... Get rid of the trained aspect. But um, I really like... Uh, checks how they do this. Uh, so a 13 nature. That's what we got. Alright, the P PC who succeeds at a DC 13 nature check notices a type or a patch of Sharn. Terrell, Chanterelle Terrell mushrooms along among the fungus, which can be cooked to provide a good quality meal for four player characters. Success on this check also reveals the other fungus is poisonous. Eating it has the same effect as ingesting belladonna. Okay, belladonna. Let's find out what that is. Uh, it is in the core rule books. Um, it is alk chemical consumable ingested poison. Sometimes called deadly nightshade, belladonna is widely available toxin produced from a plant similar to a tomato. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Let's see if... There we go. Alright, import entry. I'm gonna close that. We're going to... Oh, we don't need the precarious pile anymore. Thank you very much for the though. PCs who wish to harvest these poison mushrooms can use them as four doses of the, of the poison. Ooh, very interesting. Mm. 
Okay. And it does not have a check for harvesting. So now if they want to harvest it, they can. But there's only four doses available is what I would go with. This icebox still contains the lingering chill from the magic that once kept the chamber cold, as well as a few slowly melting blocks of ice. It is clear, at some point in the past, the magic failed. However, leaving behind clusters of fungus and a rusted holy casserole pan. <laughs> um, I love that they kind of stuck to this story with it. Very nice. Alright, so there's A5. Now, A6. Um... A6 is down here, um, and it's interesting because you got this, like, I almost want to say a Komodo dragon from the top view, but I am not very familiar with such creatures, um, but it definitely is a reptile. This gigantic hallway opens into another chamber to the east. Crates and furniture are stacked against the walls, atop which sits a dusty, sits dusty games and an old ugly duck toy an enormous taxidermy alligator okay so that's supposed to be an alligator looks like it yeah like I said looks like a Komodo dragon more than anything is crammed beneath the gaming table huh. this room contains stacks of old dish sets that are too good to be used, old games, a few scattered toy children toys, and random taxidermy pieces that are too sentimental to get rid of, but too patchy and tacky to be displayed in the house. Uh, in, in addition to the completely lifeless taxidermic alligator, this chamber holds three fluffy taxidermic dogs. The malign influence of the soulbound doll, Camilla, has animated these former family pets into undeath, and the creatures attack anything living that enters the room. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> uh, to taxidermy your own dogs, uh, that, that, to me that's just a little creepy. Um, but okay, that's what we got. We got taxidermy dogs. Um, Changes heading two, uh, two, three, four, five. Um, got block quote for the gigantic hallway opening up. We have our creatures. Um, now, let's see what we can do for um, the dogs. Um, I'm not seeing anything initially calling out as well there's nothing to click on for the creature um, that would say hey this is what the creature's family is like what it's coming from so um, just because we've had so much stuff from bestiary one I'm gonna just go in here I'm gonna search dog um, and I'm just gonna compare them real quick just because nope it, so what we're looking for is a creature one um, armor class 16 okay fort seven reflex five will th oh, it's a will three speed 30 not 35 okay so we're close with the riding dog not quite though um, what a, I don't think the gob blend dog is gonna be it no it's further um, but the writing dog's close. Um, let, yeah, let's just take a look at Beastary 2 and 3, I guess. Um, I doubt we'll find anything in those, honestly. A blink dog, no, that's not going to have it. Um, yeah, I, I knew a blink dog was going to be a far stretch. Um, Well, um, 
Let's let's see how the attacks. Jaws, plus seven. Damage is one d six plus two. Okay. Well, um, I don't know what these maps are. I guess I have to import first. Let's see what we got for map, what this map does. Oh, and I roll natural 20. Multiple attack penalty. Okay. Um, so. I wish that scroll to bottom would go away so we can see the actual bottom. And then we can click damage and I roll damage. Minimum damage. Oh, it was a critical though. So let's roll critical like it should be. Woohoo, rolled a two. <laughs> oh, interesting. So, um, uh, we don't have a buck action, so we're going to get rid of that. Um, yeah, let's go ahead. Let's just go through this, see what we got. We got perception of a plus seven, low light. Uh, we don't have anything beyond that. So we're going to get rid of that. Um, taxidermic dog. Uh, we're going to go with NE, neutral evil, small creature. And then it's got the tags mindless and undead. All right. Um, you know what? Let's try this. Uh, it's not going to be quick and easy like I was hoping. I was hoping I could just type and hit enter. Um, but. It's not going to be that simple. Alright, there's immunities. We do have resistances with this one. Alright, so this is going to be interesting. So we got cold. Uh, cold is a 5. Uh, we have electricity. Also a five. I wonder if I have to keep typing the five. So let's try this. Pierce. Save. Yep, it does five naturally. Okay. And slash. I would have thought they'd be uh, vulnerable to slashing personally. All right. Um. Plus two, plus two, plus two. Yep. Uh, minus five. Plus two, minus one. Okay. Um, HP is a 17. Okay. That corrected. Three on the will saves. Uh, I do see that we do have pack tactics already on here. Uh, the dog strike deal an extra 1d4 to creatures within reach of the dog's two allies. All right. There's that. Um, yeah, I think that actually does it for this creature. So we're good there. Uh, didn't take too much, so that's nice. Oh, recall knowledge. Okay. OK, 
Okay. Cool. Oh, and then if they're attacking with pack tactics, I click that, hit strike. Alright, good. That's gonna hit, roll damage, and it automatically rolls that d4 with it. There we go, that is very cool. I like that. Uncheck it and it no longer has it. Alright, so for this space, um, we have the three taxidermic dogs. Uh, we also have Camille in here, so let's drop Camille in here as well, so it's easy to do. Um, let's drop in our taxidermic dogs. Uh, neutral evil, small, and mindless undead. Let's get those tags separated. Um, close this item. Alright, um, I don't have any pictures for the dog right now, uh, so I'm just going to drop three dogs in here. Because, why would someone put a dog in here? Who knows, but they did. So, I'm going to have to find some art for a dog. A taxidermy dog from up above. Uh, it doesn't have to be a taxidermy dog, it just needs to be a dog. All right, A7 over in here, we have Camille's Lair, or Camilla's Lair, and it is Severe 1. Oh, this is very interesting. Alright. This room holds luxurious furniture, including a child-sized bed and forgotten children's toys piled upon it. Um... Where's the bed then? I, I would expect that since they had this custom art made that they would have everything with it. Okay. Um, and we're, we're just going to finish up chapter one and we'll pick up with chapter two another time because this has actually been really enjoyable. Um, this is the stuff I like doing. This dainty gothic bedroom is the domain of Camilla, a four foot tall, ooh, a soul-bound doll that is formerly the playmate of generations of children who lived in this house. The doll was so beloved and well taken care of that a spark of consciousness began to develop within the toy. Tragically, Camille's last playmate, a child named Ella, died young in a tragic accident. Unaware that the toy had a spark of life within it, the child's grieving family put Camilla away in the basement, along with Ella's beloved, life-sized toy riding pony. Princess Sunset. Camilla was left in the dark, unable to understand why she had been abandoned, calling out for a friend who would never return, and slowly going mad with loneliness and grief. Uh, creatures, this, the doll, so, doll slowly recreated a chil child's bedroom from the contents of the basement and is mortally offended by any intruders who aren't her former playmates. As soon as she becomes aware of intruders, she says, Play with me! in a sing-song voice. She and Princess Sunset, the riding pony, then attack. Oh boy. <laughs> oh, that is, oh, that's creepy. <laughs> All right, well, let's get this in here. Um, uh, there is a conclusion section, so that'll be after this. Um, Let's get back down to where we belong. Alright, 
So I'm gonna I'm curious how this is gonna work because we're gonna have two separate secret blocks. Um, but they're right on top of each other. I hope that they keep separate and they do. Perfect. Um, just because um, like I'm gonna they're gonna have different things. So Alright, um, Princess Sunset, that one, that one's going to be a kind of an annoying one to put together in my opinion, just because it is going to take some time. So I'm going to see what else we need to do with this scene, other than, you know, drop in Camille, Camilla, my bad, and, um, the pony that she rides, uh, Princess Sunset. But, um, we got, oh, not, we got block quote. Did it do, oh, it did do both, that's interesting. Now we can get rid of Camilla there. Um, actually, let's do this. Um, it normally includes insert image, source, we're going to Camilla. Um, and we're going to go with Camilla. Insert. Exactly how I needed it to look. Perfect. Let's take a look at what the journal actually looks like. Um, because right now, I'm thinking this looks pretty good. Um, it looks to have everything we're going to need. Uh, the only thing I could see that I'm immediately like, hey, let's do this, is um, see, that, that's great. You can click on it, pulls up the full-size picture. You can show to players. Uh, this is going to be great. Um, I'm going to, what I want to do is I want to go to the trap, the precious pile, or precarious pile. Precarious pile over here, and up here we got the precarious pile once again. Uh, I want to edit this just because I'm going to copy how that is worded for the disable. I'm going to put that there. Then um, the collapse trigger. I want to uh, edit this. Oh, we got to go into edit mode. That's right. Details. Description. Description. There we go. Um, I actually like having that separated like that. that that's actually really cool. Um, and there we go. I'm going to save that. Uh, and I am happy with how this has turned out so far. Uh, this is going to be a fun little adventure. Uh, I think I think I'm going to enjoy trying out this adventure. Uh, it is looking to be quite fun. I could see it being a two-part adventure where chapter one is the first part and chapter two is the second part. The chapter two we didn't get to yet today. But so far, it has been very interesting uh, to see how everything is kind of interacting with each other. Uh, I absolutely love that the kobolds are um, accidentally breaking into someone's house and thinking they're exploring an ancient ruin um, when it's somebody's basement. Uh, so this is going to be a very fun adventure. I look forward to seeing what comes of it. Uh, and so n tomorrow night I'm going to be looking at uh, another game system, Savage Worlds, but I think what we'll do is next Wednesday we'll pick this up again, and we'll either Wednesday or Sunday we will take up the second chapter and see where we go with that. So till then, have a good night, 
and keep playing your games.